Could open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at that now and those words that I read earlier. Shockwaves go through this world from time to time. Tsunamis. Tidal wave that comes and wrecks homes and ruins lives, causes devastation. There are moral shockwaves as well that we saw some years ago with the Twin Towers in New York falling down and the ramifications of that go on and on. The shockwaves continue. Tidal waves, earthquakes, explosions, terrible destruction. Everything changes and usually for the worst. And today we're thinking about, again, about the shock waves that had their epicenter in that tomb a few meters outside the walls of Jerusalem those 2,000 years ago. The tsunami that came or comes occasionally means death and destruction. The resurrection of Christ means life and hope. And indeed, the resurrection of Christ changed the face of the world. Death no longer was irreversible in its process. It was seen as a great triumph after death. And these 11 disciples of the crucified Jesus, who six weeks before were devastated, despairing men, turned the city upside down those six weeks later with their indestructible message of sheer joy. God has has reversed the verdict. Jerusalem got it wrong. The leaders got it wrong. God has had the final word. And Peter and the other apostles are out in the open in Jerusalem preaching the resurrection. It's very disturbing. And it would later get them into big trouble. And if you'd been a member of the Sanhedrin or the Jewish establishment and you'd worked very hard to rid Israel of Jesus of Nazareth, public enemy number one, the one who had threatened your authority and your standing among the people. If you'd had heard Peter's sermon, as we have it in Acts chapter 2, It's unlikely that you would forget it very quickly. And all your efforts would be reversed. All your work, all your scheming, all your lies, your judgment of Jesus, your verdict verdict of him in that court in Jerusalem, your verdict would come to nothing. You crucified Christ. God raised him. So first of all, as we look at these words, as we look at these verses here, we're going to see that there is a higher court. There's a higher court than the earthly courts. There's a higher court than the old Bailey. There's a higher court than the the Supreme Court in America. Chapter 2, verse 14, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Peter's not a teacher of the law. He's not a rabbi. He's a fisherman. And there's something weird going on here that this man should stand up with his other disciples in Jerusalem. And what Peter does here in this first New Testament sermon He shows us how to interpret the Old Testament. He quotes the prophecy from 800 years before. This is what was spoken by Joel the prophet. Verse 16. Joel said, verse 17. One day everyone will be like a prophet. One day everyone will be like a priest. The word of God will be available to all. Just as the prophets prophesied and they received dreams and they had visions as they did back then. So your sons and your daughters will have the word of God for themselves. They will know all that the prophets knew and they'll know more than them. The sacrificial system will end. It's all over. The priests and the prophets will get the sack. And all will be priests and prophets. 
We don't really feel the true impact of this moment, do we? Here's Peter, a few hundred yards away from the place where Christ was executed, a few hundred yards away from the tomb itself, and it's six weeks after. And many in the crowd saw Jesus stumble to that cross and be crucified, nailed to it, with a placard over him saying, this is the king of the Jews, officially declared dead by 3 p.m., laid in a tomb. And now this name has come back to haunt the leaders in Jerusalem, the authorities, and Peter hands them a massive accusation. Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, signs, wonders and signs. You know it. You saw lepers healed. You saw the lame walk. You knew that thousands were fed. You knew the, re- the dead were raised. You knew the storm was stilled. You couldn't miss it. Verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death, put him to death, nailing him to the cross. You are a disgrace. Shame on you. You judged him to be worthy of death, but God has overturned your verdict There is a higher court. Something of an embarrassment, I suspect, when a judge in one court has found a man guilty and sentenced him to prison, only to find that in a higher court, the decision has been overturned. You got it completely wrong down there in the lower court. And speaking of Jesus And to these Pharisees and these members of the Sanhedrin, you thought him worthy of death, God thought him worthy of life. You condemned him, God vindicated him. You gave him a crown of thorns, God has given him a crown of glory. You put him on the cross, God has placed him on the high throne. You got it wrong. God and you are dying diametrically opposed. God declared him guilty. God declared him innocent. A higher court has reversed your decision, reversed the the decision of a human court. You and God are at loggerheads. You have got a problem. And do notice here, Peter does not merely preach the facts. He doesn't say, well, I've just told you about the resurrection, what I know about it, I'll leave it with you to draw your, your own conclusions. No, he's saying here, you've got blood on your hands. You are personally guilty of his death. That's the message. The highest court in the universe has declared Jesus innocent and has declared us guilty. Peter preaches, and many people could hear what he's saying. It was a large crowd. Priests and teachers were there. Elders were there. How do you explain that these disciples showing cowardice a few weeks earlier, some of them sometimes skeptics, one or two of them doubters at times, how could they be so bold? How could they stand one day in a few weeks' time before the very authorities that Jesus stood before, stand in the very court that Jesus did, and stand there and say that Jesus is Lord and God? So different. This resurrection has changed everything. Quite clearly, the resurrection was a fact, and these men are uncompromising. You saw him, you saw the miracles, you heard the gracious words, and you people are guilty, and God has reversed what you have done in a higher court. Also, Peter here declares there is a higher king. There is a higher king. 
Verse 23, at the end you nailed him to the cross, but, verse 24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And now he goes back to the David, King David, and his prophecy. David was Israel's greatest king, Israel's prophet, who saw way beyond his own time. David was promised a dynasty that would be eternal. Verse 29, but David is dead. Buried a thousand years before this moment. His memory was kept alive. There was his tomb in Jerusalem. So why did he say those thousand years ago, verse 26, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see decay. King David was king in Israel's golden age. David never lost a battle. David was the shepherd king. David was the giant killer. But he died and he was buried. His body was taken through the streets of Jerusalem. He was buried in pomp and ceremony and people longed for another David. A thousand years later, as Peter speaks, they still long for another David more than ever because the Romans had them in an iron grip. They were waiting for a warrior king. They were waiting for David to strike back, as it were. What did David mean when he said, you will let your Holy One see decay. You will not let your Holy One see decay. David was dead. Verse 31. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. The one taken down from the cross by a few kind friends who was quietly buried just before the Sabbath. That's who David meant. Verse 32, God raised this Jesus to life and we are the witnesses of the fact, says Peter. Israel pri Israel's pride rode high on David. Those were the days. Those were the days when the nations respected us. There were the days when, Dave, when, when God blessed us. But David is dead. So the question now is what value do you put on this King Jesus? The despised Jesus. For all David's might, for all the illustriousness of his reign, there is a greater king. A greater king who would overcome death itself. Even for David. There is a higher king and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. But Peter also declares here there is a higher power. Verse 24 it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. A higher power than death. And death is a monster. Tennessee Williams, who was an American playwright, says this. Man does not have a pig's advantage. Why is that? What advantage does a pig have? It doesn't know it's going to die. But we do. We have that knowledge, we live with it. And the question is, do you really understand this? The truth scares us. There is a king of terrors. One day the gates of death will slam behind us and there's nothing we can do about it. Death is a fact of life. It happens everywhere, every day, to everybody. We can never get used to death. It always evokes deep emotions. Death is always unnatural. And it's the Bible that tells us why we must die. Why must I die? Will I die just because I get old? I'll die because I'm a sinner. Caught in a rebellion against God. Condemned to die. If I was not a sinner, then I would not die. And Jesus himself died, or he gave up his life, but that death, when it came, was powerless over him. It could not keep him down. Verse 24, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. 
The resurrection is the vindication of God the Son. He is the Redeemer. He's the Anointed One. He's the Perfect One. He's the One and Only who is righteous, whose righteousness is acceptable to God. And here is the only one who died and was not a sinner. And he was not a sinner because I'm a sinner and only a perfect man could die for my sins. And be sure of this, the icy grip of death that got hold of Jesus most certainly, it could not keep its grip on him. I wonder what you think about this, that isn't it time that scientists got together and dealt with this thing, death? Why can't they get all the experts together? Why can't they get all the brilliant geniuses together of the world, get all the machinery and all that's necessary, and deal with it now? But they can't get rid of this monster. They can't do it. The truth is, Death gets us all. But it was different for Jesus. And that's because he wasn't a sinner. He's the saviour. He died on Friday afternoon. He was raised on Sunday morning. And the resurrection is vindicating him. Yes, he's the one. He's the one and only. And one reason we have the Gospels Four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is to show us this extraordinary man, this sinless life. You would have thought, wouldn't you, if these men really wanted to write something that people would be interested in, they'd make it more plausible, more realistic. To our fallen minds, we would be quite happy if few character faults came up in Jesus. We'd say, well, that's fine. We're all only human, aren't we? One or two one or two imperfect reactions, but they present us with perfection, purity, sinlessness, everything that you and I are not. And that's why in verse 24, it was impossible to death to keep its hold on him. The resurrection is the assurance that God has accepted that life as perfection for our sins. The assurance that we will be accepted by God, without, rever without res reserve, that's what the resurrection tells me. How can a believer be charged with guilt? It's impossible. The price has been paid. The sentence has been served. There's a higher power. Sin and death are defeated enemy. And that means when the memory of sin troubles you, Remember, you can do this. You can go to God. The accusations against you are not his. There's been a resurrection. The sacrifice for sin has been paid and accepted. Jesus is vindicated. There is a higher power. And this power has overcome death itself and raised Jesus from the dead. And he's active today. And that power is active today. I suspect within the last few days, hundreds of churches have been planted across the world. Thousands have come to Christ across the world. We may not see that so much at this time in this country. This country has a history with God at the moment. But nevertheless, God is moving on. He's unstoppable. People try to stop that. I remember some years ago, uh, the Birmingham City Council decided that there should be no mention of Christmas in various public places. Well, where the military government of China failed, we might say it's unlikely that Birmingham failed as well, and they did. The first sermon, the day of Pentecost, brought men and women into a new world together where death has lost its power, there is a greater power. A higher court, a higher king, a higher power, the church goes marching on. But Peter also declared here, there is a higher name. And here's the punchline, verse 36. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, 
both Lord and God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord for those who lived in those days. Jesus is Lord above Caesar. To say the least, Peter is not PC here. He's politically incorrect. The whole sermon comes in defiance of the status quo in those days. Jesus is Lord. Lord over Caesar. Lord over presidents. Lord over prime ministers, city councils. Lord over judges, over pop stars and filmmakers. Jesus is Lord. And no one is exempt from the universal judgment of Christ. He is above everyone. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that flies in the face of every other loyalty that we may have. It gives a whole new world, a whole new view of the world. This is the way of the new thinking, a new way of living. There is a name that is above all names. There is a higher authority than any on earth. Only Jesus. And victims of injustice on earth may know that this the courts of this world do not have the last word. We may be troubled by the implications of living in a society that is pluralistic. But think of the society that the apostles lived in when they were preaching. Infinitely more formidable than anything that confronts us today. And Peter says, Jesus is Lord. And Peter assures these people, it's not Caesar that you will answer to for your sin. It's not the Sanhedrin. It's not King David. It's not those other gods. It is Christ and Christ alone who is Lord and God. He is the higher name. You know, there was a journalist, some of you may remember him, called Bernard Levin. Last time I ever heard of him was probably in the 1980s. But he was no friend of the church. But he wrote about Christ. And he wrote this, his message is derided, his messengers persecuted, their words dismissed as ravings of madmen. But each time the smoke and dust settles, there he is, imperious to it all and beckoning us again. The dust settles in Jerusalem, verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What do we do? What are we going to do? They feel guilty. Jesus is Lord, what shall we do? We've been caught out. We're in a mess. Not everybody feels guilty, do they? Hitler, for instance... I don't think he ever brought leaders of the Third Reich together at the last minute and say, men, I feel guilty. Look at what we've done, the horrible crimes against humanity. What are we going to do? How are we ever going to cover our shame? They didn't feel guilt, but were they guilty? Yes, they were. Many a bank robber or lager lout has found themselves in prison for their crimes. Do they feel guilty? Not necessarily, but they are. And you need to cry out, what must I do? Feel guilty or not guilty, I am, you are. And Peter's reply, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for your forgiveness of your sins. We're called not only to believe, not only to repent, but to openly confess, Christ is Lord. How do I do that? Well, it says here, be baptized. Obey Christ in everything. Show that Jesus is your Lord. Because Christianity is about burning bridges. It's about crossing the Rubicon. It's about declaring that Jesus is Lord. Like Peter living in a new world, a higher court, a higher king, a higher power, a higher name. In a world where Jesus stands in all his glory 
and resurrection power, he can say, I have wrenched the keys of death from the keeper of death, and I will live in the power of an eternal life. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. He is Lord and God. Let's sing our last hymn together.